times. Why should I perform for them? What have they ever done for me? But it is now 9 o'clock. Okay, kill that music. Uncle Kage, will you tell us a story? Since you asked so nicely, I think I will. <laughs> ah! I'm going to guess that most people who are sitting in here know who the hell I am and why the hell they're here. Uh, does anybody, okay, has anybody never seen me perform before? Damn, oh, Jesus Christ. Why the hell are you here? They say, I have nothing better to do. Let's go watch an old guy get drunk on stage and throw up on his shoes. Ha, but that's what I do. I have been the storyteller, the raconteur, the bullshitter, call it what you will, since about 1993. Holy fuck, that's 20 years. Jesus Christ. God, I am old. Because I was 60 when we started. Anyway, yeah, I'm old, trust me. I'll give you another minute on that. Slow audience, we can tell. Basically, I just get up and I talk about shit that's happened to me. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Is there a rating? Can I say shit? Is it, you know, can I say fuck, can I say cunt, is it over? Yeah, sure. Is Nonsanity Cat's little daughter out there? No, they They gone home? Okay, are there any youngsters in the audience? Okay, good, put the little cunts at home when they belong. <laughs> nah. For those of you who don't know who the hell I am, I don't know either, so we're even. Yeah. They call me Uncle Kage. In the professional world, Dr. Conway. I have a PhD in chemistry. Ivy League PhD, Dartmouth 1991. That's why I wear this white coat and everything. I am an actual chemist by trade. So this is not just a costume, this is my work uniform. But at some point, uh, people thought that it was fun to get me drunk and have me talk, so I'm doing that right now. Hi, Tony, you're late, have a seat. Um, you're late. You're late. You're late. It is 9.02. Old students of mine from back at Dartmouth when I used to teach classes hated and feared me. Because I was the, the douchebag teaching assistant that at 9 o'clock I would lock the doors. <laughs> you don't come late to my lectures. Because I don't do late. In fact, anybody who's on Anthrocon staff, by the way, I'm the chairman of Anthrocon, if you don't know that shit. Yeah. Everything at Anthrocon starts on time, because I don't do late. Damn right. The staff knows that if something starts late, the chairman is going to whine and cry and throw a hissy fit backstage and basically be such a pain in the ass that will make their lives hell so things start on time. Everybody wins. Do you like my hat? Yeah. This is my new hat. I, I have always been a fedora man. Uh, I've always worn fedoras, and my old fedora wore out finally after eight years, you know, because you're always tipping it to old ladies and stuff, you know, you've got to tip your hat to old ladies, you know, and it finally, like, you know, disintegrated. So I, I gave it away to somebody, I don't remember who. But I wanted to get a new hat. So my dear and sainted parents took me to my favorite hat store, which is Hats in the Belfry on South Street in Philadelphia. And that's it, see what it says, Hats in the Belfry, it's true. And the problem is, you do not choose a hat. The hat chooses you. Every hat is different. Little subtle differences in hats can make one work and one not work. I tried on every single black fedora they had and it didn't work. And on the way out the door, disappointed and tearful, I saw this, this derby, derby in the United States, by the way. It is, uh, you know, everybody says, oh, that's, that's a Homburg, that's a this, that's a that, then, okay. This is America, this is a fucking derby, okay? <laughs> All right, it's a bowler in England, this is not England. So I picked it up and I put it on, I was looking and I'm like, hmm. 
know, I, I kind of got this Bat Masterson thing going here. <laughs> this one works. And the reason this works is this hat is screwed up. If you look at it, this is basically a factory reject. This is the hat they would have thrown out, but they decided they might get a couple dollars for it. This hat is asymmetrical. It curls up the wrong way. You know, it basically is a piece of shit hat, which is why it suits me so well. <laughs> I was so pleased with this hat because I thought it made me look so cool. I wore this hat on a long airplane flight. Now, when you're on an airplane flight, a gentleman does not wear his hat all the time. So once the plane took off, I took my hat off and I put it down at my feet. I have had so many problems with airline flight attendants who they see this down here and they're like, oh, I'm sorry, sir, you can't have that out. You're going to have to put that in the overhead or do something with it. Usually they walk away at that point. <coughs> but I had my hat down here, and I was, I was flying in first class. God, I love first class. See, I fly a lot. People fly me all over the world to do this kind of crap I'm doing up here right now for whatever reason. I don't know, but it's a great gig. So because I fly a lot, they give me all these frequent flyer miles, and they, they put me up in the first class all the time. So I'm sitting up in first class, and I got my hat down here, and of course they bring me the wine. Those of you who've seen this before know how I exercise my arm with the wine, remember that? So uh, I had my wine sitting on that little tray table, which is, you know, you know the tray table that they give you, which is about this big? You know, and it's here, and you have to kind of balance the, the wine glass on this little tray table. Well, the lady across the way, who had an ass the size of 747, stood up and backed her ass up and knocked my tray table. The wine fell and poof, all over my brand new four-day-old hat. And I was, I was, oh my God, I, I was, I was in tears. I asked the lady to give, give me some, some, some napkins, and it was like soaking into it. And I said, "This is terrible. I can never wear this hat again. Everywhere I go, I'm going to reek of wine." <laughs> yeah, this is my hat. <laughs> Incidentally, if it's okay with everybody, those of you who have seen my story hour know that I basically talk about things that have happened to me, things things that I've gone through, people I've met, uh, drinks that I've drunk, things like that. I can only have so many experiences in a given year. I'm terribly, terribly sorry. I cannot have, you know, horrible things happen to me every two weeks. So generally, as the year goes on, I, I wind up telling the same stories from one convention to the next. This is a new convention, though. No one's ever been to this convention before. I'm liking it so far. I don't know about you guys, but I think this yeah. convention is awesome. Oh, yes. I'm not just saying that because they're using my badge printer. But... <laughs> you like that badge? Yeah. It's from me. Thank you, Uncle Kagame. So, um, usually, as we get toward Anthrocon, that's when I bring the new stories out. I recycle the stories through the year and then tell the new <laughs> stories at Anthrocon. If it's okay with you guys, with your permission, I'm going to throw some new stories in today. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, try them out on you. You're like the test subjects, and I'll take notes. You know, this did not work. This worked. Because of that, I see some people filming. That's great. I love being filmed. Please don't post this to YouTube, because if you do, I'm going to have to stab you in the face with my dick. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a two of the ranting Griffin line. I borrowed that from him, but it's oh so effective. So please don't, don't go posting it anywhere, but you can show it to your friends, you can show it to your parents. Actually, no, don't show it to your parents. That, that's probably a bad thing. So uh, what's happened to me in the last eight months? Everything. I say they fly me all over the place. My, my darling friends down in Australia, mid-fur, 
or what used to be called MIDFER, they got a new name now, Australia's premier furry convention is now moving, they're making the jump to the Melbourne Convention Center, which is this monstrous, gigantic, huge, colossal place. Not as big as mine. But still. <laughs> very, very nice. Yes, it's more room than they're ever going to need, they'll learn. It's on the Yarra River in Melbourne, it's really, really pretty. Uh, they flew me down this year from Midfur, or the last, what would be called Midfur. And uh, I flew uh, Air New Zealand, or as they like to call it today, Air Middle Earth. <laughs> yes, I get it, they filmed The Hobbit in New Zealand. That's great, I'm cool with that. Leave me the hell alone. You don't need to remind me of that every 10 goddamn seconds, okay? So I flew Air New Zealand. Now, because all of my frequent flyer miles are with US Airways, they're the ones who treat me royally. Air New Zealand doesn't know me from dog crap, so I don't have any pull with them. So I was looking at what options do I have to upgrade with Air New Zealand? I'm just going to say this, it's New Zealand, okay? They offer the sky bed. Ooh, this had my attention. I can get the sky bed, because I'm going to be 17 hours in an aircraft going across the Atlantic. I'd like to be a little comfortable, because we've all flown in airplane seats, right? When you're sitting in the airplane seat and they say, okay, you may recline your seats now. Okay, great, there, I recline. <laughs> Please bring your seat backs up. Oh, okay, there we go. I wanted a little more comfort than that. So I said to them, I would like to have the sky bed. Please describe the sky bed to me. Now I will give this to the New Zealanders. They're very honest people. They didn't try to pull the wool over my eyes, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, some of you get that. They don't call them sheep shagger airlines for nothing. <laughs> the sky bed on Air New Zealand, for one thing, the flight itself, the ticket costs $1,200. For $2,900, I can have the sky bed. I said $2,900 for the sky bed? That sky bed better come with a blowjob in a newspaper. Well, what the sky bed is. What is the sky bed? The sky bed is, you know how in an airplane you got three seats across? They'll sell you all three seats and you can lie across them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making that up. That's the sky bed on New Zealand Airlines. Just, just fall over with your sheep. <laughs> so I did not go for that. I will stick to US Airways. I can fly US Airways to Germany. I love going to Germany. I go to Germany for Euroference, which I hate to say it, as chairman of the largest furry convention in the world, Euroference is the best furry convention in the world. Those guys really know how to party. First off, they take good care of me. <laughs> My favorite wine in the world comes from the Mosul Valley in Germany. They built a pipeline from the Mosul Valley to the Cotton Hotel, just for me. There's a tap at the end that says, Kage only. You think I'm making that up? Go to your own ferns someday, it's amazing. But, they also have an annual New Year's party at your ferns, or well, I shouldn't say at your ferns, the people who put on your ferns, have a New Year's party. This year they decided to hold it in a castle. There are castles all over Germany. You cannot sling a dead cat without hitting a castle. But they found the perfect castle. It is Castle Lair. And it was at one time the home of a, I believe, Prussian nobleman by the name of Wilhelm der Luvi, William the Lion. The place has lions everywhere. The lion motif, he's got lion statues, lions in the windows. Everywhere you turn, there's a lion. It's like, this guy was an 18th century furry. <laughs> Where better to have a furry New Year's party? 
So I, uh, I talked to the airline and I sweet talked them. They gave me the nice seats. And I flew over there. Now, something you need to understand about Germany is it's a very old country. There are many things about Germany that's very old, like the plumbing. <laughs> I stayed before we went to the castle in this little hotel. I believe it's called uh, the, 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 the Baron Jaeger, you know, the Bear Hunter. Uh, it, it's a quaint, and by which I mean shithole, little hotel that's, that's located in this little village in Germany. Now, they got the idea of hot and cold water down. Okay, we have that here, right? Over here, we like to mix them first so that you have tepid water when it hits your body. Over there, they do the mixing at the very end. So what you have is you have a pipe coming out of the wall that is icy cold glacier water. And then right next to it is another pipe that is water that's coming directly from the Earth's core. <laughs> Superheated steam at 9,000 degrees Celsius. When it hits the glacial cold water, it mixes in an incredibly explosive reaction into tepid bath water. But you still have that pipe coming out of the wall. Germans are a very fit people. They have very, very good reflexes. Americans do not. Because I got into the shower. Now, a German shower is about the size of this wine bottle. You see, because Germans are not fat. At, at your reference, there is one fat guy. They call him the fat guy. He's my size. Really, this is true. Germans are a very fit people, so they get into these tiny little phone booths that they call showers, and then they wash themselves by not pulling their elbows away from their bodies somehow. Well, I've been there doing an American shower, you know, rinsing myself up one side down the other. This pipe that came from the Earth's core was lurking behind me. And at one point, I suppose, not paying attention, I must have turned, and the back of my right arm must have contacted that pipe. Now, let me explain something to everyone. As you age, your reflexes become slower. Let me illustrate it this way. Imagine that your nervous system is a bunch of little guys running at top speed with pieces of paper, trying to give the brain messages. The problem is when you're old, the brain is also old. So what happened was, as I turned, and my arm came in contact with this pipe from the Earth's core, this little messenger ran screaming up to the brain. And the brain said, <clears throat> Well, um, what seems to be the, uh, the, um, uh, what do you call, uh, 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 problem today. And the messenger was like, sir, I wish to report, pipe from the earth's core has come into contact with the arm, we have pain. The friend's like, oh, all right, well, let me, uh, uh send a response. That there, oh, all right. Uh, 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 uh. Dear muscles, how are you? I am fine. You might wish to consider. Moving away from the source of the um, uh, what was it? Oh yeah, the um, uh, heat, which is currently melting you. 
I remain your most humble servant. Love and kisses. The brain manager central nervous system location skull meanwhile the messenger is sitting there going mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and meanwhile another part of the brain was thinking to itself I hear something sizzling and it smells like bacon <laughs> by the time that message got back down to the muscles I actually left a portion of myself behind. And for the remainder of my beautiful, wonderful trip to Germany, there was a particularly egregious wound on the back of my arm. Fortunately, while I was there, I didn't feel a thing. <laughs> when I came home, however, and got back to American circumstances, I felt it. Believe me, I felt it. Plus, it was starting to look a little ugly. So, ordinarily, I would go to see my family physician, Dr. K. Those of you who have seen me for many years know Dr. K. For reasons that I still do not understand, I opted, rather than to bother Dr. K, who usually indicates that things that happen to me are my own damn fault, I opted to go to what we colloquially call the dock in the box. The urgent care. <laughs> you ever, ever seen the, the urgent care center? It's just, you know, down the road from my office. I'll just drive down there. I drove down to the urgent care center. Unusual sort of place. Didn't look like a urgent care center. It, kind of looked like the castle that we had the party in, back in Germany. I was half expecting Dr. Frankenstein to come out and work on me. I didn't get Dr. Frankenstein. I got Igor. <laughs> because as I was standing there, the door flew open and he came. <sighs> Good afternoon, Mr. Conway. What seems to be the trouble today? I said, this. He said, oh my goodness. That's a particularly nasty burn you've got there. We'll take care of that straight away. Now, uh, <laughs> we'll have to get all that dead skin off of there. I'll just use this wire brush and hold still now. <laughs> Looking rather pale, Mr. Conway, I said, Yes, it's because you just ripped the skin off my arm and you're frightening me. And he said, yes. No reason at all to be frightened, Mr. Conway. We, we take care of these things all the time, you see. Let, let me give you some, some topical cream to put on that, if I might. And I looked at him and I said, Dude, that's KY. <laughs> he said, Hey! Here it isn't. Well, perhaps. <laughs> So, uh, I'm left with actually this, this half dollar size scar on the back of my arm to remember my beautiful trip to Germany. But I have to say it was worth it. Incidentally, if you ever feel the need to go to the urgent care facility, don't. Just take my word for it, don't. 
Although that's that's not entirely that that's that's not fair. That's not fair. This particular one I would warn you away from because the next day they were closed. <laughs> I couldn't help noticing that they were all boarded up. In fact, they might have been boarded up the day I went. To. <clears throat> A number of years ago, uh, I was on my way to Indy Furcon, beautiful little convention out in Indianapolis, Indy Furcon. And I was uh, delayed at the airport. They had to cancel my flight and send me out the next day. Well, I thought, this is dreadful. I shall simply get myself a little hotel room at one of these little hotels near the airport. By the way, I'm from Philadelphia. Hotels near the airport mean something else where I come from. So I went to one of these little hotels near the airport, <clears throat> and I figured, I'll just stay here the night, and I'll leave the next day. Well, I, I went to Mabib there, and he gave me a room for $28 a night. This was three years ago. What was the hourly rate? Uh, yeah, that was the hourly rate. <laughs> I went to bed, and when I woke up, I noticed this unusual rash on my poor body. And I thought, is Mabib using potassium hydroxide to wash his sheets with? Look at this, this is obviously some sort of awful contact allergy. So I simply threw on my clothes and I went to, uh, to Indy Furcon. That rash was an odd sort of thing. It itched, but as soon as you touched it, it felt like fire. It was agonizingly painful. You try to touch it, and the entire system would just go, bah! oh my god, this hurts. So I'm sitting there in first class, like this. And the flight attendant came by and said, do you work at that urgent care facility in Pennsylvania? And I said, no, I don't actually. I got to Indy Furcon. And I ran into two of the ranting Griffin. Now, he's an old, old friend of mine. I took him aside. I said, dude, I think something's wrong. And I showed him this rash. And he said, dude, you ought to see a doctor. I said, I am a doctor. He said, no, a real doctor. I said, watch your step, boy. Because people ask me, what kind of doctor are you? I said, a good one. There's a difference. See, I'm a scientist. I have a PhD. You know, Igor over there, he's got an MD. I got more letters. <laughs> That's the difference. <clears throat> so, pardon me, I have to refuel. Yeah. Boy, sound effects. <laughs> so. I decided I would go to the dock in the box out there in Indianapolis. And they, they looked at the back of my neck and my back and, they, and the, the, the lady was like, okay, this is really, really odd. She said, I've never seen anything quite like this. And I said, keep going, I'm a storyteller, you're feeding me here. <laughs> she said, it sort of looks like shingles which is a recurrence of the chickenpox vaccine that lives in the nerves of old people. She said, but it doesn't look right. She thought about it, she said, okay, I'm going to start giving you antiviral therapy in case it is shingles, but when you get home, I want you to talk to your family doctor. I said, you mean you want me to talk to Dr. K? She said, yes. I said, he will be ever so cross that I talk to you first. He's jealous that way. <laughs> but thank God she did. She started treating me with these antivirals. I made it through Indy Furcon. Yeah. Those of you who might have been there that year might have noticed I was a little subdued is because I couldn't move, except in the evenings. <laughs> when I got home, I talked to Dr. K, and I took off my, my collar and my shirt, and I showed him, and he said, hmm. He has this habit of looking over his glasses, which is terrifying to me. 
I looked over his glasses. He said, he said, I can understand the diagnosis of shingles, but it doesn't follow the pattern. And I said, well, I've never followed the pattern. You know me since I was 16. You should know that by now. He said, do me a favor and be quiet. <laughs> I love that man. And he hemmed and he hauled, and he looked at it, and he went and he got his books. He spent about 20 minutes pondering. He's a brilliant diagnostician. And he said to me, this lesion is consistent with shingles. This one is not. And he finally gave me his diagnosis. You have shingles. The little hotel outside Philadelphia Airport has bed bugs. The little motherfuckers had nommed on me right where the shingles was starting. That's Philly bed bugs for you. So, of course, here we got shingles with weird stuff on top. Leave it to Dr. K to figure that out. And I said, so what can we do about it? And he said, what do you mean we? I said, well, okay. In a generic sense, what can be done about this condition? He said, well, you're already on antivirals for the shingles. I said, yes. Can anything be done for the bed bug bites? And he said, possibly. And I said, what? He said, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I said, why not? Now this is why I adore the man and respect him so highly. He said, because I don't know where you've been, but I've known you a long time and you probably deserve it. <laughs> Here's you, Dr. Kevin. The man has kept me, he has kept me both healthy and honest for many, many years. Ah. I'm liking this chair, by the way. This chair is good for old people like me. And I'm going to sit in this chair and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to argue and grump and gripe about are you kids out there? You, you don't know how good you had it back in the day you were doing it. Did anybody go to further confusion this past year? No? I. Okay, how about yes? Yes. No, that was the same person. No, okay, let me explain this to you. Answer me honestly, you stupid shit. Okay. I do not have, we'll argue that later. <laughs> I do not have a great love for modern technology. As a matter of fact, this, this thing that is floating at my hip right now is something that I loathe. This, this. This is an, an androgynous inedible. <laughs> this thing here. It's made by Hick. Those of you who remember my old cell phone, my old flip phone, the Star Trek communicator that made phone calls and that was all it did that I loved so much, now I've got this. Let me tell you a story. I have a very good friend. In furry fandom, he's known as Decker. He works for Microsoft. He's from Singapore. So not only does he work for Microsoft, he's Asian. So he's like genetically tech savvy. He always hated my flip phone. It was always telling me, you should upgrade this. I said, I don't want to upgrade this. It makes phone calls and that's all I wanted to do. Two years ago at Christmas time, he came to visit. He always comes to visit holidays. You see, this young man from Singapore did his college learning at Cornell in the USA. And, of course, at Thanksgiving and Christmas, you can't just fly home to Singapore for three days and fly back. So he was going to be all by himself. My little dear and sainted mother heard about that and said, no, 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 bring him down here. 
So we brought him to my place in his freshman year at Thanksgiving and at dinner, and that was 18 years ago, and he's still coming back. My parents take in strays, you see. But anyway, the dear boy, well-meaning though he was, we went out and we went shopping at Christmas time. And sneaky little bastard that he is, said to me, perfectly innocent, peaches and cream. He said, can I see your phone? Sure, I said, here. And he took it, and he bolted and ran. And in confusion, I watched him run down the mall into a Verizon store. I said, whatever the hell. Oh, no, 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 no. By the time I got into the store, he had slapped it down on the counter and said, quick, upgrade this. And when I got there, this was sitting there. I don't like it, it offends me, but I can put really cute pictures of fursuiters on it, so okay, there is that. You probably can't see it, but that's a Blitzberg, he's the greatest fursuiter I've ever met, he's Pittsburgh colored. Well, so, here I've got this thing, and you can do you know, modern social medias with this thing. I don't subscribe to that theory because it doesn't work. You know why? Because at further confusion this year, I was at the bar. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> I was at the bar talking with some friends and this cougar came by. I'm not talking calamity cougar. I'm not talking happy, bouncy, furry cougar. I'm talking the old-fashioned definition of cougar. Wow. Came by. She had more than I had had. And she was getting palsy. If you know what I mean. And I'm trying to be polite because I am half Southern. <laughs> My father is a southern gentleman and he raised me properly. It doesn't matter if the cougar's grabbing your junk. A gentleman does not insult a lady. Period. <laughs> so I'm sitting there trying to talk to this lady and with this hand I'm typing on Twitter. And you look back at my old tweets. Mayday, 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 Hilton Bar, come help me. And five minutes later, for Christ's sake, someone come help me! And five minutes later, where the fuck are you people? Help me! One person came to help me. 29 people favorited it, and 58 people retweeted it. <laughs> it's true, look back, you'll see. I get this picture someday, I'm gonna be hit by a hit and run by oh, uh, uh, Dying in street, call ambulance. RT, Uncle Kage, dying in street, call ambulance. You know, social media does not work the way us old people want it to. I fall and can't get up. 28 people have favorited your tweet. <laughs> you know, 911, great. Modern technology is no friend to me. For that reason, and because it's destroyed my family. Has anybody here ever met my little old mother? She's hooked on Farmville. Oh. <laughs> we have pity for you. <laughs> have pity for me. Every Thursday, every single Thursday since 1995, I go to my parents' house 
and I had dinner with them. And since 1995, every Thursday, I would come into the house, the house that I grew up in, and my mother, she'd have her apron on, and she'd be cooking in the kitchen, and the pots would be steaming, and the oven would be on, and she'd have some wonderfulness going on, and it would be glorious and beautiful and nami, and I would have a good time enjoying the company of my aged parents. Today, I come in to the house on Thursday. I walk inside. The kitchen is dark. The stove is off. The oven is off. I walk into the family room. Here's my mom leaning over the computer. Old people style, real close, like this. I say, Mom, where the hell's my dinner? She says, not now. My cows are at 28%. I said, we well, are sons at 0%. She will continue feeding her cows with this hand while she'll pick up the phone with this hand and order Chinese. <laughs> We don't like the modern technologies. I'm sorry, back in my day, we had such things as social interaction. You don't need social media when you have social interaction. You would say to a person, hi, how are you? You use the face noises to make that communication. Oh, yes. Or you would write them a letter. You would use this thing, remember this? Remember this? You would write a letter, a letter. For those of you who are young, that's like an analog email. <laughs> How many people here were affected by Hurricane Sandy? I can't see you out there, that bright light shining on I me. Mean, let me hear you. Yeah. How many people thought Hurricane Sandy sucked balls? Yeah. Yeah. One of the many hats that I wear, besides this one here, this is one of my favorites, but one of the hats I wear, I'm the emergency management coordinator for my local town in Pennsylvania, the little borough of Malvern, Pennsylvania. Well, thank you very much. It's a thankless job. Anybody in emergency management will tell you that everybody hates emergency management. Because we're the ones who are always trying to tell you to do things that you think are stupid, like fire drills, like, uh, you know, oh, you should have a disaster kit ready. Yeah, how many people actually have a disaster kit ready to go? You're fucking lying. Go to hell. You do not. Your disaster kid is you're going to pack up your cell phone and one pair of underwear and throw it into a bag. It's true, ain't it? Tony knows. He's a firefighter. We are always yelling at people, be ready for emergencies. Okay. Hurricane Sandy comes through. First off, can we give the hurricane some better names? I don't want to be killed by a hurricane named Sandy. If I'm going to be killed by a hurricane, I want it to be Hurricane Jake. Or Hurricane Rocky. You know, or, or, or Hurricane Motherfucker. You know? <laughs> hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Lucy. Hurricane Aaron. Oh, God, that's just embarrassing. You know, St. Peter at the Pearly Gates, what killed you? Hurricane Twinkle Toes. <laughs> Down to hell with you! But the guy who's in charge of emergency management, he gets like a hard on the hurricane. I'm getting all ready and I'm telling the people, you gotta be ready, gotta be ready, must, must be ready for the hurricane. Nobody listens. What happened? Up in my part of the country, we don't have a lot of flooding, but we lose power. We've got these giant old 9,000 year old trees that have like power lines going through the trunks. <laughs> now, the wind comes, gives the tree a blow job, the tree falls down exhausted, and the power goes out. <laughs> now, the particular neighborhood that I live in has a lot of old people in it, elderly people. 
That's the people I'm here to take care of. I was working that day, and I was getting worried because the power had not come back on. Try to have the power company tell you when the power will come back on. Even the official, excuse me, power company, when will the power come back on? Eventually. <laughs> I'm not making that up. That's what they told me. Eventually, I said, I'm the fucking emergency management coordinator. They said, we're the fucking power company. Eventually. <laughs> I have a lot of elderly people. It was cold that night. They're not going to have any heat. They're not going to have any light. But those of you who have the advanced internet crap like Xfinity and Verizon Fios, when you lose your power, you lose your phone. And I don't want elderly people having no phone communication. So, all right, time to open a shelter. That's what we do. We will shelter these people. That is our duty, to see to their needs. So I called up a, a beautiful Catholic retreat house. Say what you will about religion. You know, the religious organizations, when disasters come, they're the ones you turn to. The Catholic retreat house answered the phone. I said, I might have to send some people your way. They've got heat. They've got light. They've got a kitchen. They said, how many? I said, anywhere from two to 2,000. And they said, you've been talking to the power company, haven't you? I said, yes. <laughs> I said, I don't know. I'll tell you what, let's aim for 100 and we'll go from there. So I opened up the emergency response center. We're all ready to go. Got the borough manager in there, and I was like, yes, this is, I am the emergency management guy. I am in charge of the town now. I'm the boss. Okay. I called up the county and said, I need a, what we call reverse 911. The county will now call your phone and tell you, if you have no power, you can go to this particular location and get shelter. But a lot of these people don't have power to their phones because of that Xfinity and Fios thing. What do I do? Ah, called up the fire department. Get me as many volunteer firemen as you have. Bring them to me. Got them all together. And one of the town's two police officers. It's a small town. Yeah. <laughs> Very small town, by the way. We have two cops. I had one of them. The other was on vacation. So, I said, okay. Firemen, I need you guys to go door to door. You're going to go door to door, and you're going to bang on the door, bang, 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 tell people, hey, if you're cold, if you need help, if you, you, anything's wrong, you can go to the Catholic retreat house down here. There is heat, there is light, there is power, there is food. Wonderful. Police officer, I need you to go through the streets and I need you to announce on the loudspeaker, you know, you know, ladies and gentlemen, a shelter has been opened at the Catholic retreat center. If you need blah, 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 you can go there. And just say that over and over. And the cop said, I don't think that'll work. I said, trust me, it'll work. When I used to do this back in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, when it would flood down there, well, that's what we would do, and it would work. People would listen. He said, no, I, I, I don't think it works. <laughs> I said, what, what the hell are you talking about? I said, well, we, we never actually tried out the loudspeaker on the squad car. <laughs> Small town. <laughs> so I said, okay, never mind. Just go do cop stuff, okay? I'll let, I'll let the, the firefighters take care of this. I was ready. This took four hours. Okay, all the firemen are in place. Everything's ready to go at 5 p.m. Bam! Reverse 911 goes out. Okay, we're ready to start. 5 o'clock p.m. And 10 seconds later, I heard the borough manager in the next room. I heard her say, oh, it's on. Maybe she's having an argument with her neighbor, and she's saying, oh, it's on. <laughs> I went in and I said, what's on? She said, the power. <laughs> it is not. <laughs> Where is it on? She said, this neighborhood. Ah, just that neighborhood. We have a whole town. That's only one neighborhood. I know what I'll do. I'll call my house, because I have an old-fashioned answering machine that plugs into the wall that's powered. I'll call my house, which is on this end of town, 
And if my answer is picks up, there's power. And if it doesn't pick up, there's no power. Great. Okay, so I picked that up. And I listened. My answering machine is programmed to pick up on the fourth ring. And it rang, wake up! He's falling asleep. Nudge him, nudge him, nudge this guy. Yes, hit him, hit him, hit him, hit him harder. Thank you. I dialed my phone. You were falling asleep. It rang four times, and I gave it just one more. It rang five times. I said, okay, good. As I was about to hang up the phone, I heard my voice. Okay. Got on radio to dispatch. I said, where is that police officer right now? What is his location? And they told me his location. And I said, tell him to remain in that location. Do not leave that spot. Because that then allowed me to drive at 90 miles an hour through the rest of the town looking for lights. And they are all on. Now on one hand, this is good, right? But I worked so hard. <laughs> I called up county and said, okay, cancel the reverse 911. The Catholic retreat house is cooking dinner for a hundred people. I got in my car and I went charging down there. And I ran into the front. Here was a, a nice gentleman in priest garb and the manager, they, they stood up and I said, gentlemen, I got good news and bad news. And they said, what? I said, the good news is the power's back on. And they said, what's the bad news? I said, the power's back on. <laughs> and the priest went, running into the back, into the kitchen, just at top speed. And I thought, what's going on? And from in the back, I heard, Aah! I said to the manager, what's that? He said, that's the chef, he just finished dinner. And I had this mental image of this little Mexican guy coming out with a cleaver coming after me, so I just left. So I really don't know how that story ends. But I think it ends with me being dead. That was the sum total of my experience with Hurricane Sandy this year. I do not at any point wish to minimize the suffering of those who had actual damage I do not want to put down those who did real work. But for Christ's sake, I just wanted to have one little disaster. <laughs> Yet when you're an emergency management coordinator in a town where nothing happens, they can drive you kind of stir crazy. A branch breaks off a tree and I get an erection. It's like, ah! <laughs> it's a tough life, believe me. It's a tough life being furry, too, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I want to ask everybody here a question. All of you. Has anybody here ever felt that they had to explain that they were a furry to someone who wouldn't understand? Has anybody ever been afraid to tell people that they're furry? Has anybody ever felt that they had to come out as a furry? Yes, you have. I hear this all the time. People say, and this is so screwed up. People say, oh, Uncle Kage. My parents have no problem with me being gay, but I can't tell them I'm furry. They say this to me. Okay, I picture their father. Oh, well that's okay, son, you know. A lot of young men like to suck dick, and that's, that's perfectly all right. If you like to take it up the ass, that's, your mother and I still love you, you're a son. But dad, I like to wear fox ears. Get out, out! Get the head sinner! 
Does this actually happen? No. We have some people out there who, we call them haters. Furry haters. The people who ruin it for the rest of us. Most of it is us! We've got people out there who are like, Oh, Mom, Dad, uh, I, I'm a furry. If you say it like that, how do you expect them to react? People say, Uncle Kage, do people know you're a furry? Yes. My family knows. My coworkers know. The entire goddamn city of Pittsburgh knows. <laughs> because when people ask me to tell what goes on in a furry convention, I tell them what goes on in this room, not what goes on up there. That's your business. But so many people are like, you want me to tell them about that part? You know, that's another, that, that's another talk that I got. I'm gonna leave that for another talk sometime. But there have been some circumstances where some really, really beautiful furry things have gone wrong. We have lost a number of people this year. This is time to give a shout out to, to those who have gone before. There's like five, six, seven prominent members of the fandom have left us in the last 12 months. One of them, you may remember, Panda Guy. Yes. Panda Guy was one of the driving forces behind a picnic that was held yearly in Glen Echo Park in Maryland. Uh, Sharky pretty much ran the everyday things, but it was called the, the Panda Guy Picnic. Panda uh, departed this life a couple of months ago, was it? Very, very tragic loss to all of us. But this picnic was held at Glen Echo Park in Maryland. And it was a remarkable community event because the furries would come to the park and they would put their fursuits on and they would play and have fun. The local people started to recognize that this was happening every year. So they would plan their kids' birthday parties. They would plan family events. They would plan to be there when the furries were there. This is called community relations. And Panda and Sharky did it magnificently. At Glen Echo Park in Maryland, it was a beautiful time to be had by all, until, until, the man with the pink shirt showed up. As any, ah, I heard in the background, I was there. Someone remembers the pink shirt man. The furries were having their picnic and the kids were playing with the furries and the fursuiters were out there frolicking with the kids and they were dancing and riding the carousel and visiting the, the birthday parties and everything was great and people were having a ball! Until one little boy was playing with the furries and some people Random people were taking pictures of the furries and this little boy was in the pictures. This little boy's father, a prominent Washington, D.C. lawyer with a pink shirt with a popped collar and a Hummer II in the parking lot, became upset. Why are these people taking pictures of my child? He ran to the park superintendent and started screaming, have you done background checks on these people? Who are these people? I want to know who these people are. This is terrible. You cannot have this going on here. He called the police. The police were summoned, and they took poor Sharky off to the side to interrogate him. I took it on myself to visit some of the birthday parties and some of the Beltway soccer moms there. And I said, ladies, I beg your pardon. I, I feel very, very awkward asking this, but this has happened. You know, the, the pop collar pink shirt douchebag there called the cops. At any time, did you feel threatened by us? And they said, no, of course we did not. I said, could I ask you please to go speak to that police officer? And they did, they spoke on our behalf. Glen Echo Park 
from an administrative standpoint, they kind of had to ask the furries not to come by anymore. That's how things work. But what I saw out of this entire circumstance was we had one douchebag and his family and his brood. And we had the furries and we had all these people. We had the soccer moms, we had the kids, we had the parents, we had the park employees all standing up and saying, no, we were having a good time. There's a moral to this entire story, and that is simply this. The next time you encounter furry haters, just remember this. There's more of us than there are of them. <laughs> I've only a very few moments left, and I'm going to close by remembering of the many people we've lost this past couple of months, one who is a very, very dear friend of mine. Uh, a gentleman, many of you knew as Lemonade Coyote, oh. Timothy McCormick. He was a uh, emergency medical technician in Indianapolis who was tragically killed in an accident with his ambulance that also claimed the life of his uh, crew member. Uh, Lemonade kind of Coyote was well known uh, as a first surgeon. He was very bombastic. An excellent young man, very, very outgoing. An Eagle Scout. A gentleman who was openly and unabashedly gay, yet still had the respect of the Boy Scouts of America, which is no small feat. When he died, the entire city of Indianapolis came to a halt. If you go and look up the name Timothy McCormick in Indianapolis on YouTube or Google News, whatever you prefer, literally everything stopped. The mayor of the city postponed the state of the city address so as not to interfere with the funeral service for this gallant saver of human beings. All of the news stations had footage of his body being brought by an ambulance to the chapel where they had his final farewell ceremony. Flags flew at half staff. They are now talking about naming one of the streets in Indianapolis after him. This is what I want to leave you with. This was a man who, at his eulogy, was said, and I concur, he was a man who lived life for others. A man who had the respect of an entire city, an entire state. The governor of Indiana personally attended his funeral. This was a man who, as I said, brought the entire city to a halt to stop and stand silently and to salute him as he went by. This man was a furry. He was a fur suitor. The next time you run across one of these furry haters, the next time you run across one of these people who say, oh, furries are this, furries are that, show them the YouTube videos, show them the news clips of this gallant young man that had won the respect and admiration of an entire state. Show them that footage. Show them the outpouring of love and support for this man, and then look him in the eye and you can say, fuck you. <laughs> Perhaps somewhat harsh and vulgar words to end the performance, but that's the end of my list. I really don't have anything else to say, and my hour is up. So, for having sat there for an entire hour and listened to a drunken old man rattle on about nothing in particular, I can only thank you for your patience. Okay. You do have one more thing to say. God's talking to me. This is God, yes. Hi, God. Okay, so repeat after me. 
The Drunken DJ Show. The Drunken Idiot Show. <laughs> DJ, not idiot. Oh, Drunken Idiot. D D Drunken Idiot DJ Show. Right. Is occurring in the bar. <coughs> is occurring in the oh in the bar. Yeah. Right. So everybody who's here should go there. Go to the bar. Thank you. Yes. Okay. We have cakes of free beer in the bar. The beer is free. The bartenders are working overtime. For Christ's sake, give them a little something. Remember the bartenders, give them a good tip, ladies and gentlemen.